Hi, this is Amanda Cosser, Biomonitoring Program Manager at the New Hampshire Public Health Laboratories, and today I'm going to be going over the Targeted Arsenic and Uranium Public Health Study. But first, what is biomonitoring? Biomonitoring is looking for chemicals from the environment in people by testing urine, blood, hair, nails, or tissue for those chemicals or their breakdown products. Why do we want to do biomonitoring? Well, we want to do biomonitoring to learn whether and how chemicals are getting into our bodies and whether those chemicals are affecting our health so we can reduce our contact or exposure with those chemicals and stay healthy. What's in your environment? How might you be coming into contact with chemicals from your environment? Well, you may have an older home that has lead paint on the walls, or maybe you have older lead or copper plumbing, and those metals are actually leaving your plumbing and entering your water supply. It might be from your occupation. You need to consider, are you wearing the proper personal protective equipment or PPE to reduce or eliminate your contact with chemicals? It might be from your recreational activities. This kayaker going down the river here, we can be pretty sure that they're swallowing water as they go. Or maybe you're an avid hiker or outdoorsman and you use insecticides or bug spray on your body to prevent tick or bug bites. Or maybe you're an artist and you use paints or pigments that contain chemicals. You may also come into contact with chemicals from the foods and beverages you consume. And those chemicals might be naturally occurring just because of the soil that the food is grown in or they might be added to your foods and beverages, such as pesticides. And you might come into contact with chemicals from your everyday activities, such as just normal air pollution, or maybe you or someone around you is using tobacco. How can we use biomonitoring? Well, it serves as a public health surveillance tool. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, has the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES, and this survey allows us to know what the average levels of over 300 chemicals are in the U.S. population. And knowing what those averages are, it helps us assist when we have a targeted investigation where we think people are at increased risk of being in contact with a certain chemical. So that's our second bullet point there. And two great examples of targeted public health investigations of potential community exposures in New Hampshire are the PFAS, or per and polyfluoral alkyl substance um, exposures of uh, contaminated drinking water in southern New Hampshire around a plastics facility and on the former Pease Air Force Base, now known as the Pease Trade Port. So we're using biomonitoring to test the blood of people who have been exposed in those two areas to see if their blood levels of PFAS are elevated as compared to what we know from NHANES or those averages of the U.S. population. We can also use biomonitoring to inform public policy recommendations or to see how effective those policies are. An example of this is child blood lead testing. So blood lead testing has been conducted for many years and in the 1970s, there was legislation passed that removed lead from gasoline. And over time, that lead was also removed from the environment because it was no longer being emitted from gasoline. And what we were able to see is a great decline in the amount of lead in, in children and in adults across the U.S. because of this policy that was passed. And because of that, lead has also been removed from solder and canned goods and from paint. Biomonitoring can also contribute to, to disease diagnosis or rapid response efforts. A few years back in Maine, there was a church gathering where coffee was actually contaminated with arsenic and people fell ill very rapidly. And through biomonitoring methods, the locals in that area, the local hospital, was able to detect you know, what chemical was in their bodies and actually able to determine the source of it, the contaminated coffee, and then be able to make recommendations so these people could get healthy again. Biomonitoring can also be used to inform individual and consumer choice. It can help you decide what types of products you'd like to use, like this skincare product here, or it can help you decide whether you need to treat your private well water, and that was why we conducted the targeted arsenic and uranium public health study. 
a New Hampshire specific study to inform private well users. So a little background on public water supplies versus private wells. Public water supplies are subject to the Safe Drinking Water Act. So this is a federal law and it says that all public water supplies must have their water tested, the water must be treated if there are contaminants of concern in it above the Environmental Protection Agency's maximum contaminant level or MCL for those contaminants. Any treatment systems must be maintained and the water must continually be uh, tested. It's not just a one-time thing. Versus private wells here in New Hampshire where there are no laws saying the user must test their well water, treat their well water if it's indicated, or maintain their treatment systems or retest their water. So why should you test your well water? Well, because there are naturally occurring contaminants in water such as arsenic and uranium, and there could also be man-made contaminants such as pesticides or MTBE from gasoline. Many of these contaminants have no smell, taste, or color, but they do cause health effects. Arsenic was the poison of kings because you could not smell it, taste it, and it did not have a color. Same goes for arsenic in drinking water. It's undetectable unless you have a testing method. And whether you get sick depends on many factors. How much you're exposed to and how often, the way you're exposed, such as through ingesting, breathing, or skin contact, and personal factors like your genetics and how healthy you are. The following are some health effects of arsenic and uranium. Not all are listed here though. Arsenic can cause skin, lung, and bladder cancer. It can affect childhood brain development, leading to lower IQ. It can cause a decreased immune response when you're sick. It can cause cardiovascular or heart disease and diabetes, high blood pressure, and skin hardening and discoloration. Uranium can cause respiratory disease like fibrosis and emphysema, can affect your kidneys, and cause poor bone health. So the potential for arsenic and uranium exposure in New Hampshire. 46% of New Hampshire uses private wells for their drinking water. New Hampshire's geology, we're known as the Granite State, in our farming history, both of these have been conducive to allowing arsenic and uranium to enter our groundwater supply. These metals can actually leave our granite bedrock and enter our groundwater. And our farming history, where pesticides that contain arsenic used to be used on orchards and potato fields, and those have made their way into our groundwater. And then some previous New Hampshire Public Health Laboratory testing. There was a smaller study about 10 years ago where private well water, so these are deep drilled bedrock wells, was tested for arsenic and uranium, and so were the people who used that water as their main source of drinking and cooking water. And what we found was when there was a higher level of arsenic in the water, these people also had higher levels of arsenic in their bodies. And so we wanted to expand on that study and include a larger uh, population. In New Hampshire, the most common type of well is the drilled well that I have boxed here. The drilled well is a very deep bedrock well, and that's the well most at risk for having arsenic and uranium contamination. So why the arsenic and uranium public health study? Well, the source, the arsenic in our granite bedrock, people are exposed because arsenic's getting into the groundwater and then into our private wells and the health effects. New Hampshire has the highest rate of bladder cancer in the US and arsenic contaminated drinking water has been shown to cause bladder cancer. And so that's our concern here. How did we go about conducting this study? How did we decide on who we'd, we would recruit? Well, we use this map on the left here from the United States Geological Survey or the USGS. And this map shows the probability of arsenic above the EPA's maximum contaminant level in groundwater. So the darker the color, the darker the red, the higher the probability of having arsenic above the MCL in the groundwater in that area. And so we identified 27 towns in southern and southeastern New Hampshire. And that's this larger box here. You can see the town names. There are 27 towns in light green. Those are our targeted or our well user towns. And then the one darker green 
city there. That's the city of Concord. We use the city of Concord as a small comparison population to learn about other ways people are coming into contact with arsenic and uranium because the city of Concord is on uh, the public water supply. So altogether, we recruited 515 people from 258 households on well water and 51 people from 35 households on the city of Concord public water supply. Oops, go back one. And we did this with our recruitment postcard. So we randomly selected households to receive this postcard, inviting them to participate in this study. We did allow some people to self-select or contact us and let us know that they'd like to participate even though they didn't receive that postcard. We then set up an interview meeting. And during this interview meeting, people signed our informed consent form. So this form explained the possible benefits and possible risks associated with participating in this study. And then we conducted our exposure survey where we asked demographic questions and ask questions about other ways they might come into contact with arsenic and uranium, such as through certain foods or their occupation or recreational activities, and we did collect some health information. We then asked people to complete a food log for the three days before they collected their urine specimen. We did this because there are certain foods that contain arsenic and uranium, and we wanted to track their exposures in that way. We also asked people to not eat any fish during the three days before they collected their urine, as fish can contain organic arsenic, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on. But we'll say at this point in time, organic arsenic is not thought to be toxic to us. Finally, during the interview meeting, we also went over the sample collection process. At the laboratory, the public health laboratories in Concord, we tested their urine for creatinine. This is a protein to see how diluted their urine basically is. And actually, the creatinine testing was contracted to a local hospital. Our public health laboratory's biomonitoring program tested the urine for total arsenic in uranium and then tested for arsenic speciation only if the total arsenic was greater than or equal to 20 micrograms of total arsenic per gram creatinine. As we move forward, I'll just refer to this level as 20. So arsenic speciation testing was done on the urine only if the total arsenic was above or equal to 20. And then arsenic speciation was done on for these six arsenic species here that I'll go into a little bit more detail shortly. Water was also tested at the New Hampshire Public Health Laboratories, and it was tested for arsenic and uranium, but then also tested for these other metals and water quality indicators. And this was our way to incent participation and to thank people for their time um, in this study. So total arsenic versus the arsenic species in urine. So total arsenic is the sum of all arsenic in urine. The species that we tested for can be broken down into inorganic arsenic and organic arsenic. The inorganic arsenic species are arsenic 3 and 5. We've included DMA and MMA as inorganic arsenic species in this testing because although they are forms of organic arsenic that are created by the body during the metabolism or breakdown of inorganic arsenic, if a person has contaminated well water, then you're most likely to have DMA and MMA in your body from the breakdown of that bad inorganic arsenic that you consumed, either that arsenic-3 or arsenic-5. And because of this, we and the CDC have grouped them with the inorganic arsenic species. DMA and MMA can be consumed from other sources, but there's if there's arsenic in your well water, this is your most likely source of exposure. So as far as the species here, inorganic arsenic, we have arsenic-3, 5, DMA, and MMA. And organic arsenic, we tested for arsenobetaine and arsenocholine. Organic arsenic, like I mentioned before, is not thought to be toxic to us. And these two organic arsenic species are most likely to come from fish or shellfish. And that's why we asked people to not eat fish or shellfish for the three days before they collected their urine specimen. 
all of our participants received this uh, personal results packet on the left, this orange packet. In the packet, they had their individual urine and household water results, some study summary information, answers to frequently asked questions, and recommendations on how to reduce their exposure to these metals, as well as some next steps. They also received our summary report here on the right. In the following slides, we'll review the findings that we put in the summary report. So how much arsenic and uranium was found in urine? So this table here, we're looking at the total arsenic found in urine on the far right, and then the amount of uranium found in urine. First, we're gonna break down what populations we're looking at or what groups. So our targeted participants here, targeted participants, those are our well users. Our comparison participants, these are the people on the City of Concord public water supply. In the U.S. population, this is that NHANES data from the CDC that I mentioned. So total arsenic in urine. These are our well users. These are our public water users. This is the U.S. average. So it looks like there's a lot more total arsenic in urine of these people on, on private wells. And yes, these, this number is higher than what's in the city of Concord water or um, those people from the U.S. population. However, there's not a statistically significant difference between this group, these groups here. And that's most likely because total arsenic, we're looking at both that bad inorganic arsenic that could be coming from well water, and we're also looking at the, the fish arsenic. So what we really want to look at is, is there a difference between these groups just based on the amount of inorganic arsenic or bad arsenic in their urine? If we quickly look, again, we're looking at the geometric mean or the averages. So if we look at the average of uranium in urine for these various groups, they're all very similar. There's no statistically significant difference between the groups. So what we want to look at next is the amount of inorganic arsenic in their urine. And we're going to do this by looking at the arsenic speciation testing subset. Again, total arsenic was the sum of all the arsenic in the urine. Speciation testing let us break it down between the inorganic or bad arsenic versus the fish arsenic that isn't thought to be toxic to us. So now we're looking at the arsenic speciation testing subset. So these are the people who triggered that secondary testing, that arsenic speciation testing. So those were the people who had that 20 or higher level of total arsenic. So not everyone received arsenic speciation testing. And in this table, we're looking at our well users, our targeted participants who triggered that speciation testing, our city of Concord people, so our public water who triggered that speciation testing, and then we're looking at information from the U.S. population. We can't directly compare our targeted participants and our public water participants with the U.S. population just because of different test methods. So CDC, with the U.S. population, everyone received that speciation testing. In our study, only those people who had that 20 or higher level received speciation testing. So we have to keep that in mind here. We provided the information um, just so you could see how the levels were different. So now we're looking at the amount of inorganic arsenic in urine, so that bad arsenic. Our well users was at 9.73. This is the average of the well users for that bad arsenic in their urine compared to 4.02 for our public water users. Again, it appears that our well users have a higher amount or more inorganic arsenic in their urine than the public water users. But again, this is not a statistically significant difference. The most likely reason for that here is because the city of Concord only had 11 people who actually had this testing. It is what we anticipated finding, but because of the small number of people here who actually had the speciation testing, it's not a significant difference. But the Biomonitoring New Hampshire program is about to launch another study where we'll be conducting statewide surveillance. So from 
recruiting participants from all across New Hampshire, and everyone will receive speciation testing. And so we'll be able to take another look at this and see if there's truly a significant difference in the amount of inorganic arsenic in the urine of people who use wells versus the people on public water. Do the private well water users who had speciation testing have more arsenic in their water than the ones who didn't have speciation testing? So what we're looking at here is just people on private wells. Both of these are targeted populations, so people on private wells. This column here, these are the people who had that 20 or higher total arsenic in their urine, so they triggered speciation testing, versus people who had lower total arsenic in their urine, so they did not have speciation testing. And what we want to know is, do those people who had the speciation testing have higher levels of arsenic in their water? And the answer was yes. The people who triggered that speciation testing had a lot higher arsenic in their water compared to people who did not trigger that testing. The water arsenic average here for people who had that additional testing was 0 0.018 compared to 0 0.004. The EPA's maximum containment level for arsenic in water is 0 0.01, so this is above that MCL. These are private well users, so they're not forced to treat their water, but if this was a public water supply, then they would have to treat their water because this is above the MCL. What this is telling us here is that there is clearly a contribution to these people's bodies of arsenic from contaminated well water. I do want to mention that the New Hampshire State Legislature is currently considering a law of lowering the maximum contaminant level of arsenic from 0 0.01 to 0 0.005, so cutting it in half. Everyone should know, though, that the goal is to have no arsenic in their drinking water, so a goal of zero, because we don't know whether there are health effects, effects from long-term low-level exposure to arsenic from our drinking water. Does the amount of arsenic in your urine vary depending on how much private well water you drink? The answer to that is yes. We did see more arsenic in urine when people drank private well water that contained high levels of arsenic. So this table right here, this chart, what we're looking at is the average level of inorganic arsenic in urine, so that bad arsenic. And we're looking at people who drank less than four cups of tap water per day versus those who drank four or more cups of tap water per day. And the darker the color here, that means the water had higher levels of arsenic, and these two darker colors means the arsenic level was above the EPA's maximum contaminant level. And so what we saw here between people who drank less than four cups of tap water a day and those who drank four or more cups of tap water per day, there was a greater increase in the amount of inorganic or bad arsenic in their urine for these people who had a lot of arsenic in their tap water. So again, the tap water is contributing arsenic to these people's bodies. That's what we get out of this graph. Does the amount of uranium in your urine vary depending on how much private well water you drink? Yes, there's more uranium in urine when people drink private well water that contains high levels of uranium. This graph is set up similarly to the previous one. So we're looking at the amount of uranium in urine and we're breaking it down for people who drank less than four cups of tap water per day compared to people who drank four or more cups of tap water per day. This darkest color here, this is uranium in well water above the EPA's maximum contaminant level. And we saw the greatest increase of uranium in urine when their well water had a lot of uranium in it. And so again, we're seeing a large contribution of uranium to the body because of contaminated well water. And finally, we also saw households treating for arsenic in their private well water still had arsenic in their urine. So this table here, we're looking at the amount of inorganic arsenic or bad arsenic in their urine. These are people who told us they have wells and they're actually treating for arsenic compared to people who have wells but they aren't treating for arsenic. 
So these people, they're treating for arsenic in their water, and yet their bodies still contain very high amounts of inorganic or bad arsenic. And what this is telling us is either they don't have the correct treatment system to remove arsenic from their water, or that their treatment system is taxed, it's overburdened, there's too much arsenic in their water and they need additional filters, or they're not maintaining their treatment system. When you have a treatment system, you don't just install it and just let it be. You actually have to maintain it. You have to replace your filters every so often, depending on the amount of you know, arsenic or whatever the bad contaminant is in your water. And so our message for you all is that you need to test your well water. You need to treat your well water if it's indicated, if you have contaminants of concern. You need to continue to retest your well water. It's not just a one-time thing. You need to retest and you need to maintain your treatment system. And also test your well water after you install a treatment system to confirm that it's functioning properly. So what should you do now? If you are a participant in our study, share your urine and water result with your doctor. If you weren't a participant, but you have your well water results, you should still share that with your doctor. Have a conversation about whether you need to be concerned. You can learn about water treatment options using the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Be Well Informed tool. Use your internet um, explorer or, or other um, internet browser and search for Be Well Informed. This tool allows you to enter your water results. It does not have to be from the New Hampshire Public Health Laboratories. It can be from any water testing lab. And then it will walk you through an al algorithm and help you decide whether you need to install a treatment system. You need to continue to test your well water. Test your water every three to five years for what we call the standard analysis. So that's a large panel of metals, um, bacteria, and other water quality indicators. Test your well water every year for bacteria and nitrates. Test your well water whenever you have work done on your well and test to make sure your treatment system is working. And install a treatment system if it's needed and make sure you maintain it. More information on water treatment questions, please contact the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services at that email address or phone number there. For medical, medical advice, please consult with your doctor. And if you are a participant in this study, we've contracted with the Northern New England Poison Center, and they can help you um, go over your test results and answer any questions or health effect questions you may have. What will the New Hampshire Public Health Laboratories do with this information? We'll provide education, like webinars and community meetings like we've been doing. We now have increased testing capabilities and the training needed at our lab to continue this biomonitoring testing. We may make policy recommendations. We have to talk with our department's management team about that. And we definitely will be adding to the existing arsenic and uranium research. We had many collaborations to make this a successful project. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention funded this study. They were also available to us offering the technical exp expertise along the way. The New Hampshire Public Health Laboratory Water analysis lab and our laboratory information management system team helped conduct testing as well as host our data. The New Hampshire Environmental Public Health Tracking Program helped recruit our participants. They actually performed some of those participant meetings for us and they also have a public portal called Wisdom where our data will be um, uploaded shortly. The New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, Drinking Water, Groundwater Bureau, and the MTBE program. We work closely with them for their expertise and guidance as we developed our, our water test package. And we are actually also able to offer additional water testing through this collaboration. The United States Geological Survey, like I mentioned before, we targeted our participants based on their arsenic risk model map. And we have also collaborated with the Northern New England Poison Center and the Dartmouth Toxic Metal Superfund Research Program along the way for health risk guidance and information for our participants. So thank you all for listening. And don't forget, you need to test your well water, treat your well water if it's indicated, continue to retest your water, and maintain your treatment system. My contact information is there if you have any questions. Thank you for listening.